<laughs> and there again, with endless money, we were unable to have people hear us. It's amazing how this high-tech stuff gets glitches. Think a microphone. microphone would now be totally foolproof. Well, so we have this newspaper, which formerly had monopolistic qualities, and, and it, like many newspapers, it, it, it was a fine business, and it required some management even so, but it was foolproof. And of course, the world changed for us as for other newspapers, and a million a year free taxes, what we have left. Whether it would keep going down a little or hold there, I don't know. But I bet you you're holding this stock because you want that newspaper to come back to its former glory. <laughs> I suspect you developed some different rationale. The, what we did as we, as we were in the same position other newspapers were in, where they were shrinking toward oblivion, was we made a lot of money out of the foreclosure boom. We had more than 80% of the foreclosure notice business, and the, it was like being an undertaker in a plague year. It was, it was huge prosperity for us, coming at a time when everybody else was in total agony. Well, that gave us a lot of money, and, and we used that money to buy securities at, a, at low prices during the panic. And, aided by that peculiar response to the, to the deterioration of our newspaper business, we have entered this software business. And that has been a slow, expensive, troublesome thing. Now we've written off practically everything we spent on it. And we had plenty of tax of income to do that with. And what's happened is that we now have more software revenues than we have print revenues. And that business is doing way better. Now, it isn't doing better in terms of reported earnings. But on the sales field, we're just doing better and better and better because our product, we honestly believe, is way better than the, our main competitors. And there's an endless market for software in these public agencies. District attorneys, adoption agencies, courts. You can hardly imagine anything more sure to keep flourishing and to keep needing more and better software systems. Now, it's agony to do business with a whole bunch of public bodies and their consultants and their, their bureaucracies and so on. And it's such agony that a lot of big companies that are in software don't come near it. You know, if you're Microsoft, you're used to easy money. And this just looks like agony. They did buy one little business, which is about half as difficult as ours. And I think it's worth more than they paid for it, but it's not a great success. So the, the really big boys find our niche in the software market such absolute agony that they tend to stay out of it. And uh, I think our products are probably better than, than those of our main opposition. But of course, our opposition has way more of the market. But nearly as I can tell, we're gaining every month. So what you people have now is sort of a venture capital operation in the software business with the tag end remnants of the newspaper attached. And the stock may be reasonable if you like highly valued venture capital investment, but for you old-time Ben and Graham groupies, you're in a new territory. I'm not saying it won't work, but if it works, you don't really deserve it. <laughs> All right, with that, in, uh, now I'll take questions. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Hi there. Uh, Max Clark from Marina Del Rey. 
two questions. Uh, one is about journal technologies, and the other is about your philanthropic work. What would you like to talk about? No, no, you're asking the question. <laughs> so, with journal technologies. Um, in, in the next year, can you tell us about one or two opportunities that you're really excited about for journal technologies? And also in the next year, what's one or two hurdles or threats that you're concerned about? The one that I was most excited about, Kelly Journal Technologies, was getting the contract from the Los Angeles courts. One of the biggest court systems on the earth. Yeah. It's a crucial milestone on the task that we took. And you could stop and think about it. If we succeed in saturated California with a good success, it may well spread elsewhere. So it gets to be, I mean, not that it already is elsewhere. And we bought this little nothing of a software company. People in the little valley and, and uh, it's, it's in Utah, or I don't know. Utah. 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 And, and it turns out that, that they're very good at all this service to all these clients that need it for service. And we now have how many employees in in Utah, Jerry, between 80 and 90. And how many do we have in headquarters? Total, total for journal technology would be around 155. We have an office here in Portland and in Corona, California. And how many people in our traditional business, the newspaper? So we've, we've, we've crossed over into a new business. And the new business is interesting because it's a big market. It's a big market. And, and I think if you ever get entrenched in it, it will be very sticky business. Which has occurred to us as we suffered all this agony. <laughs> At least we were suffering agonies in an attempt to get a position from which we'd be hard to dislodge. So that's what was the second question. What is a threat or a hurdle you're concerned about? Well, the main threat or hurdle is that we want to be the most important player in this new niche, which is a big, big niche. And uh, and of course, we're concerned about that. I don't regard that battle as won. I regard it as, as, as going well, but not won. I, I, I think I'd go I'd say going very well, but not won. Uh, my name is uh, Jason Wong. I'm from, I'm from Stanford University. Uh, first, uh, we have a group of students. We are very grateful that you uh, donated the uh, uh, Munger building. Many of us uh, live there. It's one of the most uh, beautiful buildings at uh, our campus. And uh, my question is that uh, we heard you talk, uh, say, you said that the only thing you want to know is uh, where you're going to die and you never go there. And it's a very powerful philosophy. And then you talk about investing, you want to stay in the so-called competence. And then uh, a few years ago, uh, Warren Buffett decided uh, to buy IBM. And uh, then uh, uh, he, he's still very optimistic. And, uh, uh, and some people say maybe he walked out of his uh, uh, circle of confidence. And what is your comment about this investment? What do you think of the future? Thank you. Well, IBM is a lot like us. They had a traditional business that was very large and very sticky. And of course, the world changed. And, and a lot of what flourished in the new world, they were not the leader of game. Oracle and Microsoft and all kinds of other people who were formerly not so large. And of course, they didn't do well really in the personal computers, even though they, they well started with it. And so IBM is in a position a lot like us, where they have an old business from which cash continues to flow, but they want a new product that's a hit. Now, the product they have chosen to back is this. I call it an automated checklist. 
Well, an automated checklist is a very good idea. Yeah. It may be particularly useful in things like medicine. But is it the kind of super market that may replace a lot of what made IBM great? Now, I would say the jury is out on that. I don't really have an opinion. In other words, I'm, no, I'm neither a believer nor a disbeliever. I regard it as a mystery. Uh, it could happen and it could not happen as far as I'm concerned. I do think the old business of IBM is very sticky and will die slowly. <coughs> It's not a cinch. The truth of the matter is that at Berkshire size, where we have to make great big bets and hold them for long periods, that's a tough game. And, and, and we, we have to make bets that are not the kind of shooting fish in the barrel kind of bets we used to have. And that's one of them. So if you want to lighten on, on, on that one, my, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. <laughs> It may work in a mediocre way, it may work big, I just don't know. Nick Henderson from Northern California. Thank you, Mr. Munger. Um, so I wanted just to thank you for sharing your wisdom over the years. Um, and I would like to, uh, two questions for you. The first is, uh, what advice do you give to your grandchildren uh, as they launch uh, young adulthood after college? And then the second question is, do you have a favorite investment story from the old days, for example, you know, Belge Oil or your uh, you know, that Canadian arbitrage? Well, regarding the grandchildren, I was not able to change my children very much. <laughs> <laughs> my situation reminds me what Clarence Darrow said when he read the great poem that ended, No, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Clarence Darrow said, Master of my fate, he says, Hell, I don't even pull an oar. <laughs> I feel about changing the children. And regarding the grandchildren, thank God they're somebody else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> I've served my time. Stamps, which control Westville and Westville, 
is that they eventually were some of the most fairly successful investments in the history of mankind. Now, what's interesting about those outcomes is it was only five or six transactions that carried all the freight, really heavy freight. Now that is really interesting when you stop and think about it. You try and do a zillion little acquisitions and then churn and headquarters. It's hard, but by just doing a few things over a long period of time and having them work out well, those little nothing companies, they were all doomed. The trading staff business, savings and loan association, savings and loans pretty well gone, and yet they, they worked out fairly well. There again, just a few good decisions over a long period of time. Some great investment success once said, you make your money by the waiting. Now that doesn't mean you sit around waiting for the next impression. You can't do that. But a fair amount of patience is required in some of these good investment records. Patience followed by pretty aggressive conduct when the time comes. Imagine sitting there having all this money rolling in from the foreclosure room and deploying it in like one day at the bottom pick for some of those stocks. Now that was luck. And it was luck that we had caught the bottom pick. It wasn't luck that we had the money on hand when other people didn't. We're willing to deploy it when other people were. <coughs> Hi, Mr. Munger. My name is Steve Yang from Irvine, California. I have a question about Berkshire and one about the Bay Journal. Uh, historically, Berkshire was built around its insurance operations to provide a low-cost source of capital. What other business models did you try slash consider but ultimately did not pursue? Well, we were always opportunistic. We wanted to buy the best thing that was conveniently available that we could understand. In the early days, we thought we had a special advantage as investors in marketable securities, so we tended to look carefully at float businesses. Nowadays, of course, we've got an enormous float, and it's not much, hasn't been that much used to us, such is the nature of life. We made so much money out of those float businesses, it was obscene in the early days. And it's not a tragedy that, that now our float businesses don't get much advantage about the flow coming. Berkshire's cash, which is large, is not getting much of a return. In Europe, the rates are negative. In Japan, the rates are negative. So. Uh, and the question about the Daily Journal was, uh, the Daily Journal is involved with software business, as you mentioned. What do you think about the attractiveness of the average software business versus others you're familiar with, such as industrial franchise? <laughs> Software-based businesses, some of them have become some of the most profitable businesses on earth. Other software companies are failing and shrinking. So it's like the rest of capitalism. It has its good spots and its bad spots. And as I said, the one we're pursuing, I think, will be sticky if we succeed in it. <coughs> It seems like journal technology is growing slower than some of its competitors. It seems like journal technology is growing slower than some of their competitors. Um, a, why is that? And B, uh, they seem to be paying for very high multiples, five times sales. Some of the other you know, companies for acquisitions. Would you ever consider selling journal technologies at a high multiple? Well. Nobody's offered us a high multiple technology. <laughs> and so we have had the problem and or the opportunity. It's a peculiar part of the software business involving a lot of agony now for a payoff way later. And you can't judge it as a normal business or as a normal roll up of profitable companies. Venture capital will burst into 
success. This venture capital of what works could gradually evolve into a pretty huge business. But of course, everybody's trying to evolve into a pretty huge business, and only a few will succeed. But we're not like a normal software business, and those little companies, you shouldn't call, those are not acquisitions like Berkshire Hathaway makes acquisitions. Those were not established companies that were sure to succeed and relatively foolproof. Uh, we were going to make their, our venture capital type assault on this peculiar part of the software market. We needed momentum from other sales forces and service operations and so forth. So we just bought them. But don't, don't judge those things by the standards of normal corporate acquisitions. Those are part of venture capital. And you don't like it, why you lump it? <laughs> My name is Alex. Tesla sold. 
so I'll have this well, so I expect the ID to work out. BYD is in a position on purpose to benefit from this electrification trend in the world. It's very helpful to them if the people are dying on the streets of Beijing because they can't breathe the air. They have to go to electric cars in Beijing. And they grab all these sub pieces and so forth. And BYD is ahead in terms of efficiency. Manufacturer, manufacturer of these electric cars. So, and electric forklifts in this country, you really want a forklift chewing out carbon dioxide, I mean, carbon monoxide in the middle of your warehouse. I mean, so electric forklifts are, forklifts are a very big idea. They're, they're very well located. So, that's a very interesting venture capital investment. Now, it was an accident, sort of. That Virtually departed from its standard methods and did that one. And it's an accident that the Daily Journal is doing its version of venture capital. But I would say that I only wish our prospects were as good as BYD's. And by the way, they might be, but it's it's not the way to bet. Sounds too elementary, please. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so my question is about uh, as as an investor, uh, when you buy a business or, or a company, uh, what this company should you assuming the company is in your circle of confidence? Uh, I've been reading a lot, and you know, in some books and some people's notes uh, from here, uh, they say that, uh, for example, this we're about to use. Uh, a risk free rate, or something like that. Sometimes make some adjustment as the discount rate. And uh, other, other notes I read from you uh, is that you're going to use an opportunity account approach, meaning that uh, your next best investment. So, uh, which one of these is correct, or is there any way to read without it? Because there are three problems with this. They're both correct. Obviously, it's relevant to what the return you get on government bonds is. That affects the value of other assets, but the general climate. And obviously, your opportunity costs should govern your own investment decision making. If you happen to have a rich uncle who will sell you his business for 10% of what it's worth, you don't want to think about some other investment. Your opportunity cost is so great, considering everything else you should forget about. And, and most people don't pay enough attention to opportunity cost. Now, bridge players know about opportunity cost. Poker players know about the opportunity cost. But American faculty members and other important people, they hardly know their ass don't play the hot squash. I don't. So, when you try to arrive at the valuation number, what? When you try to arrive at the valuation number using the discount rate, does that does that mean that uh, uh, between between the two rates, uh, you, first you're gonna get a We don't use numeric formulas. That way, we take into account a whole lot of factors. It's a multi-factor thing, and, and there are trade-offs between factors. And it's just like a bridge hand. You have to think of a lot of different things at once. And there's never going to be a formula that will make you rich just by going through some numerical process. If that were true, every Mathematical nerd that gets A's in algebra would be rich. <laughs> and that's not the way it works. But you've got to be comfortable thinking about a lot of, a lot of different things at once and correctly thinking about a lot of different things at once. You don't have a formula that will help you. And all that stuff is relevant. Opportunity cost, of course, is crucial. And, and, and of course, the risk free rate is part of a factor determines how attractive some common stock is. Uh, final clarification. Uh, do you do you use the same rate for different business? For example, uh, Coca-Cola versus an IBM or versus a uh, The answer is no, of course not. Different businesses get different treatments. They all are viewed in terms of value and they're weighed one against another. But of course, we'll 
will pay more for a good business than for a lousy one. We really don't want any lousy businesses anymore. We used to make money by having lousy businesses and kind of wringing money out of them. That is a painful, difficult way to make money, particularly if you're already rich. <laughs> we don't do much of it anymore. Sometimes we do it by accident because one of our businesses turns low. <laughs> Most of you aren't going to get one. 
I'm JD from Phoenix. Uh, at Berkshire last year, you said that rationality was one of the things that was most important to you. Uh, what advice can you give someone who's looking to improve his own rationality? Well, I'd say if you start working at it young and keep doing it until you're as old as I am, it's a very good idea. It's a very good idea, and it's a lot of fun. Particularly if you're good at it. So, I can hardly think of anything that's more fun. So, and I, I think I have a lot of cousins in this room. Yeah. Oh, I, I can say you're on the right track. It isn't. You don't have to be the emperor of Japan to get bummed out of rationality. You, you can avoid a lot of hopeless messes. You can help other people scramble out of their messes. You can be a very constructive citizen, but you're always rational. Yeah. Being rational means you avoid certain things. It's like, I don't want to go where I'm going to die. I don't want to go where the standard result is awful. Where is the standard result awful? Try anger. Try resentment, try jealousy, envy. All these things are just one way tickets to hell. And yet some people just wallow in them. And of course, it's a total disaster for them and everybody around them. And, and uh, another one is just awful of self pity. If you're dying of cancer, don't feel sorry for yourself. Just chin up and suck, suck it up and play through. Self-pity is not going to improve anything, including my own cancer. Self-pity is just forget about it. Take it out of your repertoire. Hi, Mr. Munger. Yeah. My name is Stephanie here. I have a personal question for you since you mentioned marriage. Um, increasingly, men and some women don't find the ROI on a long-term committed marriage <laughs> worth it. And Obviously, that it still means different things to different people in different parts of the world and has for a different periods of time. But I'm curious what your evaluation is of the investment of marriage. <laughs> well, I think different folks can live in different ways. I think all the evidence is that marriage is the best practical alternative for most people. And, and, and the statistics show it. They live longer when you measure happiness physiologically by time smiling and so forth. The married people do that. <coughs> it isn't a lot of marriages don't fail and there aren't more marriages that were made in hell and all that. But considering how difficult the world is, it's your best chance for most people. And of course, it should be valued. That's one of the things I like about the Asian cultures. The, the, the Confucian idea that family is really important, and friends too, for that matter. Uh, it's a very sound idea. If we ever lost the family values, we would have one hell of a lot of civilization. Hi, Charlie. Uh, Jeff Bush from Rochester, New York. First of all, happy belated uh, 29th. Birthday, I think it was. Happy belated 29th birthday, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, my question was around the decision to purchase the real estate at uh, Logan, Utah, versus deploying that capital elsewhere in the technology business. We think we're going to be in Logan, Utah for a long time. We had a very happy bunch of employees there. They like their work, they like their community, they like everything about it. And it's part of a business operation. We've got customers that come there. It's a very presentable building. i never seen it. It's got a river that blows by. Of course, we're glad we own this real estate. You, you, we bought it cheaply, we built it cheaply. A nice piece of property. The neighborhood around it is steadily upgraded and gentrified as we expected. And nothing wrong with owning a little real estate. Our way of getting ahead was not to be real estate operators, but we don't mind owning some real estate as part of the business. Hello, it's 
exemplify his life. Hello, my name is Doug Moe from Houston, Texas. Uh, my question is, do you think a person who can't make money running a New Jersey casino is qualified to be president? <laughs> <laughs> a person who can't make money running a casino. <laughs> well, he did make money for quite a while. My attitude is anybody who makes his living running a casino is not morally qualified to be president. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Munger. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here. My name is Akash Vijali from Bombay. Uh, Mr. Munger, what has given you personally the greatest sense of accomplishment? That's question number one. And second is, if you had any advice to give to a younger version of yourself, what would it be? Well, you know, my family life has been more important. On the other hand, I hated poverty and obscurity. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get out of them, and I, it has given me some satisfaction, but I came a long way from where I started. I think most people who come a long way from where they started feel pretty good about it. I think most of the people would finally stay on top of it. Everest, even though they only stay there for 15 seconds, <laughs> they're kind of proud of the fact they got up there. And and so, I think that's good. Cicero used to say that one way to be happy in old age is to remember a lot of achievements in your past. Now, some people say that's too damn self-centered and you should be thinking about God or something. But I agree with Cicero. It's okay to live the kind of a life that you that kind of plays with in your old like that. And uh, what was the other question? You had any advice to give a younger version of yourself? What would it be? Well, I'm, my advice is always so trite. The, the good behavior, the being dependable, the morality. It makes your life easier. It makes it work better. You don't have to remember your lives, which gets complicated if you find all the time. In fact, it gets so complicated, you're sure to fall off and be recognized as a liar. And so, sure, I think all the old fashioned morality works, the old fashioned discipline works, and the old fashioned good behavior, and a little generosity. We all know people who really people come to the funeral to make sure they're dead. <laughs> you do not want to be in that crowd. You want to live your life so that some people are actually going to miss you when you're gone. So, uh, just every great idea. My idea, I think Kipling's gift is a great poetry. Kipling doesn't exist in the modern college anymore. He wasn't politically correct. But I think Kipling's gift is, is great poetry and it's great advice. Keep your head on all about you were losing there, so what's wrong with that? And the quote, be a man, my son. You're be a, why don't you want to be a man? You want to be some idiot child all your life. Some angry twist. There's so many of them already. There's so much to be gained by never being an angry twist. In fact, I think anger is just, you want to be philosophical. This political situation we all face now, of course it's disgrace to a lot of these people. I mean, it's bad that a leading civilization has candidates for a high office. And they get them like those we're talking about. And, and uh, not all on one party. But you don't want to get angry. And after all, politicians have been politicians for a long, long time. And uh, you want to operate constructively, vote constructively. But anger, there's just so much anger in politics now, so much automatic hatred. How can any of us really know whether the United States will be better 50 years from now? Because we vote Republican or vote Democratic, and I saw it. Who can tell what the exact mix is between compassion and something else? And so, I believe in the book. All those things were in the old behavior rules. 
by the way, the Muslim behavior rules were read a lot like the Old Testament, which of course they copied. You yeah. think they can correct it from God that really he's still Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mr. Munger. Thanks for hosting us today. Um, I have two questions. First is, how do you understand a new industry or a new business you are trying to get into where the dynamics are different? How do you get, get the insights into the specific domain? And second, what is the relationship between oil prices and economic growth? Well, that's a simple set of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let me answer the second one first. I don't really know the correlation between bond prices, bond prices, and economic growth. Oil prices, oil prices. I think it's obvious that if oil had been a little cheaper and easier, the growth would have been greater than mankind had. And in that sense, if oil gets very expensive and we still need it desperately, it will make life harder. And so there, there is that correlation between oil prices and economic growth. And on the other hand, some very peculiar things happen. If you take Exxon and Chevron and so forth, what's happened to make those things good investments over the long term is that the damn price of oil went up faster than their production went down. Now, name me another business. You get richer and richer as your production and real units keeps going down, down, down. So, not everybody would have predicted that in advance, including most of the economists. So, it's a complicated subject, but generally speaking, Having a, a lot of, and there's another trick to it. The people who really have a lot of free energy, like the people in the Middle East, have very dysfunctional economies. They're like a bunch of rich people spending their capital and not knowing how to do anything anybody else wants to buy. So maybe in that sense, having a copper hand has been good for us. My answer to that question reminds me of my old Harvard law professor. I used to say, Charlie, let me know what your problem is, and I'll try to make it harder for you. <laughs> you know, I'm afraid that's what I've done to you. Uh, so the second question was, which? The mental model of how do you understand a new industry or? Oh, yeah, uh, two at once. Well, the answer is barely. I just barely have enough cognitive ability to do what I do. And that's because the world promoted me to the place where I'm stressed. And if you're lucky, that will happen to you. That's what you want to end up, stress. You want to have your full powers called for. And believe you me, I've had that happen all my life. I've just barely been able to think through the right answer, time after time after time. And sometimes I've failed. Charlie, yeah. uh, last year at this meeting, you had some uh, very pointed comments and concerns about Valium, and I wanted to know if you had any <laughs> 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 thoughts on Valium, and are there any current companies where you have concerns similar to them? <laughs> <laughs> it probably wasn't wise for me to check myself. I have no dog in that hunt. I have no interest in the pharmaceutical business. I have no interest in Valium. <laughs> It's just you people have come so far as proof. <laughs> <laughs> I did to tell you a few stories about why I make comments about current affairs. And that yet was such an extreme example of misbehavior and crazy behavior. Calling attention to it. And it ended up with one of the valiant shareholders saying that Warren Buffett was a sinner because he owned Coca Cola. <laughs> I drew retaliation to Warren. By the way, that's a good place. If you're anybody who's mad at me today, why well, get mad at Warren? <laughs> he can handle it. He's a very philosophical man. <laughs> and, and, but it is true that, that these 
crazy false values. And this crazy excess is it's bad morals and it's bad policy. It's bad for the nation. It's just bad, bad, bad. Yeah. There's a lot of it. And of course, a lot of it is in American finance. And there's no question about the fact, in my judgment, that American finance, the truth of the matter is, it's kind of wrong. It's Elizabeth Warren would not agree with me on many subjects, and I wouldn't agree with her on many subjects. But she is basically right when she says that American finance is out of control and has too much evil and folly on it, and that it isn't good for the rest of us. Both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, not two of my favorite people on earth, are absolutely right on that subject. And, and to the extent you all see it, because this is not a manipulated huckster trying to cheat other people. And, and so you all see what goes on in the match of the craziness, the bull, the promotions, the policy accounting, the the uh, crazy trading cultures. The, it's, and it's very bad for all of us that we have this huge overdevelopment of, of finance. And yet it's very hard to do anything about it. What happened, if you look back to, say, Edwardian England or a little before, and maybe 300 people, males, owned half the land in England. They had nothing to do. I mean, their underbutlers had underbutlers. I mean, they, and what did they do? They went into the clubs of London and they sat around the card tables and they played the gamble with one another for high stakes. And that's what human nature does when people have a lot of leisure and so on. They then paid out, multiplied the wealth per capita of the world by 30 or so. And now we got all kinds of people who were like the lords of England who had all that time to sit around and play cards against one another and enjoy the thrills and pains of gambling. And we have a vast gambling culture, and people have made it respectable. Instead of betting on horses or price fights, and bet on the price of securities or price of derivatives. Relating to securities. And of course, we've had on, academic, on athletic contests. We have a huge amount of legalized gambling. And of course, a public market that operates every day with transactions is an ideal casino. And there are a whole bunch of people who want to own the casino and make a lot of money without losing money on inventories or credit risks or any of the other irritating parts of business. Just to sit there and have every night. Gold go higher and higher. So who doesn't want to be croupier in a casino? And very respectable people get drawn out of it. And they see other people getting rich at it. And there's way, way too much of that in America. And too much of the new wealth has gone to people who are either, either on the casino or they're good enough playing others in the casino. And I don't think the exaltation of that group has been good for the body politic or for <coughs> generally and I am to some extent a member of that group in the sense that after all I've hired me my career in surgery and I'm always afraid that I'll be a terrible example for the youth that I think will just want to make a lot of money with soft white hands and not do much for anybody else. I just want to be sure that I know even if you do that very honestly I don't consider it much of a lie just being shrewd about black little pieces of paper, shrewd than other people, is not an adequate life. It's not a good example to other people. And it's the reason that people like Warren and me are A, charitable, and B, we're running businesses. We're not just black little pieces of paper. And, and so I, I think that we have something going in our nation that is really very serious and very bad. And I hate to agree with Elizabeth Warren on this subject, but she's right. And, and I don't 
policy any way of stopping it, except with some big legislative change. Just, and you say, what difference does it make? Well, what happens is, as the cyclicality with gambling and securities and other assets goes on, what happens is the big busts hurt us more than the big booms help us. And we saw that when when the Great Depression ended and the rise of Adolf Hitler. A lot of people think that Hitler rose because of the Great Weimar inflation. But you know, Germany recovered pretty well for a time. Weimar inflation. What they did is they destroyed the currency. They just issued a new currency. It's rather interesting. They said, oh, people got rid of their old mortgages and the inflation will put the mortgages back and they will back our new Reichsmark. And that had worked pretty well, just like it works fairly well in Argentina or some places, or Italy for that matter. And we will do that sort of thing now. What really enabled Hitler to rise was the Great Depression. You put on top of the Weimar inflation, the Great Depression, and people were just so demoralized that, that they were subject to being snookered by a better smart play date on it. But, so I think this stuff is deadly serious and that these crazy booms should be never by people like Alan Greenspan. He's an amiable man, he's an idiot. He <laughs> 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 did not make the head of the Federal Reserve governor of all banking. Somebody whose hero is Ayn Rand, <laughs> who believed in no government at all. It was a very unlikely place to look for him. For correct decision making, and he probably got the kind of decision making we observed. I think he's an honest and tangible man, but of course he just didn't see reality the way it was. A lot of people think that an axe murder, murder happens in a free market, but well, it has to be all right because free markets are all right. A lot of those people are in my party, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jeremy. Um, the automobile industry right now uh, seems to be churning out a lot of profits. So is, is it meaningfully different today than it was 10 years ago? Uh, uh, my theory is that it's very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, is this better? Yeah. Okay. The automobile industry, is it meaningfully uh, different today than it was 10 years ago? And then part two of the question is, uh, does it make sense to have General Motors in the Berkshire portfolio? Well, uh, the second one, James, the General Motors is in the Berkshire portfolio because one of our young men likes it. And Warren was the young man who would say, please. Warren, when he was a young man, didn't want any old man telling him what to do. Therefore, he delivers that kind of freedom to his young man. Yeah, that's just the way it is. I have not the faintest idea why that young man likes General Motors. It is true. It is statistically cheap, but of course, and it may be affected by the federal government in the end. So it, it, it may be a very good investment. But the auto industry is about as brutally competitive an industry now as I have ever seen it. Everybody knows how to make good cars. Everybody. And they fly on the same suppliers, and, and the cars last a long time with very little service, and everybody leases them at cheap rents and has all kinds of incentives. It just has all the earmarks of a very commoditized, difficult, super competitive market. So I don't think the auto industry can Place. And it may actually shrink one of these days. In other words, the culture of everybody having two or four cars would actually shrink. And so I think the auto industry is, is not, a, not a safe. If I were investing in the auto industry, I'd want some place that I thought was way the hell better competitor than the others. That's hard to find. Uh, Hi, Charlie. Uh, for most of the oil market's history, there's been some entity enforcing production controls, but today Saudi Arabia has acted more as a baseload producer than uh, controlling uh, OPEC's production. Uh, 
would you suspect that this uh, will result in uh, attracted negative or attracted negative impact on the economics of all those uh, related to oil production, or is the way to bet that eventually some entity will reemerge for production control? You know, I would not have predicted that oil would reach its present price. Yeah. In fact, if you know, I mean, forced me to bet, I would have bet that what has happened wouldn't have happened. But it did. So I know. I think it is generally true that with these commodities, you can get periods of extreme high prices, like we had on iron ore, and extreme low prices, like we now have on iron ore. can do strange things, both up and down in terms of price. And of course they have macroeconomic consequences and huge consequences. If you're in Australia, having these commodities go way down is terrible. And if you're in the tar sands area of Canada having oil prices go down to where they have now, I don't even know how economic it is to produce tar sands oil at thirty dollars a barrel. My goodness, it's not very attractive. It may not work at all for me. I, you're in a, in a weird period, but I think it's the nature of the human condition that with free markets and stuff like iron ore and oil, you're going to have weird periods. Weird periods of high prices and weird periods of low prices. And I've never been able to predict accurately or make money predicting accurately those swings. We tend to just get into good businesses and then take the bumps as they as they fall. Would you please recommend some books that you've enjoyed lately? What? Some books that you've enjoyed lately. Well, you know, I two people send me books from 30 a week. <laughs> so rapidly that I no longer can all the enjoy of reading. I used to when I picked a few books of my own to read. So you're ruining my judgment of books. <laughs> I can't resist reading the damn things when you said them to me. You know, I skim a lot of them. And, and I like each one in its way because it's different from anything else I normally do. But I, I'm no longer a good bookstore. Poverty they have now 
in spite of having passed all resources. And communist China, they are legality. And frankly, we unnecessary deaths and so forth. North Korea, I mean, I'm suspicious of all this passion for equality that has such bad examples. On the other hand, if you want to look what non equality brings us, let's just take communist China. Communist China had equality, meaning that three fourths of the people were dirt poor, subsistence level poor. And, and, but they had the advantage of being equal. They were all struggling to get enough to eat to live to. And of course, when they adopted some appreciation of private property and more property rights and, and so on, and what they got was living standards that advanced by a factor of 10 or so more quickly than anybody ever had, but of course, a lot more inequality. Chinese they didn't have before. And I think it was a very good bargain for the Chinese to have, in other words. I don't think Sanders understands this at all. He doesn't want to understand it. He has a religion. He said it for 30 years. He's a Johnny One Note. It doesn't matter. As an intellectual, he's a disgrace. And I think we'd all be glad to have him marry into the family based on his personal characteristics. You know, but, but as a thinker, he's pretty bad. <laughs> now, I don't think he's any worse than some of our Republicans. But at least they're crazy in a different way. <laughs> so, uh, but the equality has one effect in a democracy that Aristotle comes on. People will cheerfully tolerate considerable differences of outcome if they seem deserved. So wouldn't mind the fact that Tiger Woods had the big income and he's the best golfer that's ever lived. Find somebody who invents some new wonder for the world or whose surgeon looks way better than other surgeons, etc., etc. But differences in outcome that are seen as undeserved and to disrupt democracy. That's why Aristotle commented on it in one of his most well-known observations. And, of course, who is getting the undeserved money in America now? Good question. It is not Bill Gates. It is not the people who create the new companies and gamble up with. We don't pretend they're good guys. But a lot of the parents here. Something because people have to be 
I think it's just, I think there's people who are preaching about inequality like Piketty and, and Sanders are wrong, but I think the people who say the undeserved wealth deserves some attention, I think they're right, and I think a huge source of the other Uh, you mentioned Wells Fargo earlier and its culture and the reason why you bought it back in the 80s. Uh, the Journal Corporation has U.S. Bank as well and this portal, which is poor culture. But in addition, you have a, a Bank of America and its culture is a little different. And I'm curious if the decision of buying Bank of America was driven by its low price or its you also see the compound in, um, it also is a compounder. The Bank of America was bought the way we used to buy security. It just got pounded so hard that it was, was selling more or less than before, way less. And there's a lot in the Bank of America with this um, Mr. Bonner, my name is Cameron from San Diego. I'd like to thank you for being a, a great teacher. You've had a tremendous impact on my life and the lives of many here. Uh, someone, the gentleman asked about books, and you get a lot of books, and I sent you some books, and I sent you a letter on the sitting enemy of the seven deadly sins. So if you could uh, maybe publish a book list, uh, we can continue writing the books in your personal library. Next, third. Sir. 
useful members of finance, but they don't escape their share of sin. What they've gotten in the habit of doing is creating these rounds of private financing, and each new one is at a higher value, but they just sneak a little clause in saying that nobody who previously bought into the venture gets anything until the new guys are preferred. Well, that is sort of like a Ponzi scheme. It's a disgusting, tricky, dishonorable thing to do, particularly since it's obscured, and of course it's being deliberately obscured. So, welcome. So, even our most reputable, reputable part of finance has dirty, sleazy activities creeping out, and it will ever be thus. Large amounts of easy money cause regrettable human behavior. Smongers rule. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, my second question is, apparently the environment that we invest in right now and is very different from when you started with high frequency trading, momentum trading and all that. Do you think fundamental value investing is losing relevance? I don't think fundamental value investment will ever be irrelevant because, of course, you must succeed in investment. You have to buy things for less than they're worth instead of more than they're worth. You have to be smarter than the market. That will never go out of style. I mean, that is like the rhythm case. It's going to always be with us. And now, as far as high frequency trading, that is a complicated subject. I think the high frequency traders of the world, many of whom are personally admirable, honorable people, I think they have all the contribution to the American economy to a bunch of rats doing a granary. <laughs> they just sucking some of the resources out of themselves while contributing nothing to the civilization. Hi, Charlie. Thank you for the yeah. time. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you said you change your children uh, with vacations on this uh, island and things like that. Do you have a specific approach to spending quality time with family? Well, I don't think I want to treat myself as some kind of a wonderful example of family life. I did the best I could, but I have a feeling they all agree that there's some incorrections. Do you, a second question, do you think that uh, Coach Saban at Alabama is an intelligent fanatic similar to Sam Walton? Which, who? Coach Saban at Alabama. Coach? Coach David Saban at Alabama. I don't know anything about coaching. <laughs> Thank you. I'm better about the Bullet Ballet. <laughs>
Chet Norman. Chet Norman from Lincoln, Nebraska. When you were a busy attorney, uh, you mentioned that you sold your most important client an hour a day. And I'm guessing that you spent that time reading and thinking, is that correct or do you focus on some other activity? No, no, that was my most important client with myself. You're right about that. And did you focus on the reading and thinking part or was there some other activity you did for now? No, it was reading and thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Industry. 